Warning, this episode contains major spoilers for Hollow Knight. If you have any interest in this game, I highly recommend playing the game before listening. Hello and welcome back to the Greatest Games Podcast. Today I am going to be talking about Hollow Knight. Hollow Knight is an indie game developed by a small company known as Team Sherry. Furthermore, the game's sequel, Hollow Knight Silk Song, has been announced and will most likely be releasing sometime this year or early next year. Something that is fascinating about this game is that it was created by only three people who also happen to be the only staff of Team Cherry, being R.A. Gibson, William Pelham, and Jack Vine. There were some other people who helped out, but these were more minor things like voice acting and translations. The majority of the game was created by these three people. Hollow Knight, for those who don't know, is a Metroidvania exploration and combat game. It takes place in a world known as Hollow Nest, a bug world afflicted with some mysterious curse or disease that you are trying to get to the bottom of. That's right, I said a bug world. Every NPC, boss, ally, or foe that you will come across in this adventure is a bug of some kind, including your player character. This makes for an interesting setting for a grim style of game like this, while still having options open for a wide variety of settings and characters. Finally, as of February 2019, the game has sold nearly 3 million copies and is one of the best reviewed games of all time, having nearly a perfect score on both Steam and Google reviews. So, is all this excitement around the game justified? That's what I'm hoping to find out today. When you start up the game, it begins as most games do with a cutscene. The cutscene opens with a poem that doesn't make a lot of sense when you first start up the game, but will slowly make more sense as you play through the rest of the game. The poem reads, In the wilds beyond they speak your name with reverence and regret, for none could tame our savage souls, yet you the challenge met. Under palest watch you taught, we changed. Base instincts were redeemed, a world you gave to bug and beast as they had never dreamed. This is taken from Elegy of Hallownest by Monomon the Teacher. This is an important poem, however, right now it doesn't make a lot of sense, so please just keep it in mind. The scene then cuts to a massive hulking figure in a dark cave. The large figure seems to be strung up on the ceiling by a large amount of chains. The figure seems to be unconscious, or at least asleep. Suddenly, the creature bolts its bright orange eyes open, seeming to have awoken from some sort of slumber. The creature makes a roar-like sound, and the scene zooms out to show a large boulder blocking the entrance to the cave. The massive boulder has the faces of three bugs carved into it, and the faces light up. From there, the scene cuts to a small insect-like character approaching a distant town. We don't know this character's goals or motives yet, but this character is who we will be playing as for the entirety of the game. The small character leaps off a cliff in order to get down to the town. This is where the game transitions to gameplay, showing your character falling for quite a long time. Suddenly, the small bug hits the ground and doesn't seem to have been hurt at all by the fall, further lending to the idea that this character is a bug, as many bugs can fall extremely far and survive. The way that you fell down doesn't look closed off, so there's a feeling that with the right tools you could probably climb back up. But for now, there's no way for you to get back up, so you must continue on the path that the game wants you to go on. Two things become immediately clear as soon as you take control of the character. One is the controls, which are very unique and hard to get the hang of at first, and the other is the physics of the game, which are also a bit difficult to get used to. However, after having played the game for a few hours, both aspects become easier, and you will soon realize that the controls are actually beneficial to the style of gameplay. The first obstacle of the game is a few small, weak enemies, which can be easily dispatched with your only item you currently have on you, a small, cracked sword which is referred to as a nail throughout the game. The second obstacle is something that would be simple in other games, but in this one, it will probably take about 10 minutes to get past. This obstacle is a ledge that is too high to jump up and a few small platforms. This helps get the player used to the game's physics before you actually need to make precise jumps in life or death situations later in the game. After making it past those couple of obstacles, you use your nail to bust open a large cracked door, showing the player that they can destroy large objects with their nail as long as the object is damaged. 
You then fall down one more, much smaller cliff and make your way into the town seen during the opening cutscene. Once you enter the small town, something becomes clear. The town is nearly abandoned, with only one resident in the entire town. If you decide to talk to him, you will learn that his name is Elderbug, and that he is, in fact, the only townsperson still here, and he says that the town is called Dirtmouth. He also mentions that every other member of the town has descended into the caves below and hasn't come back. Elderbug also claims that the caves are extremely dangerous and that they consume the mind of anyone who de descends into them. He finally states that the other townspeople who went down there are probably dead, but if you find them alive, to bring them back to the surface. After this conversation with Elderbug, you can now jump into a well. Don't worry, there's a rope this time. This brings you to the first true area of the game, the Forgotten Crossroads. This is where your adventure in Hallow Nest truly begins. Once entering the Forgotten Crossroads, you can go in a couple of different directions, but the first thing of note that you will most likely stumble upon is Quirrell, a rather peculiar bug who you will meet a handful of times on your journey in a handful of locations. This first time you meet him, he is located in a building near the place where you jump down the well. Surprisingly, the large boulder with the faces carved into it is in the center of the room, and Quirrell is admiring it. If you talk to him, he states that this building is known as the Temple of the Black Egg, and is the, a place of worship of sorts. He continues that bugs of all kinds used to come here and pray, but once a mysterious infection started sweeping through the area, all the bugs stopped visiting the temple. He also tells of how he is simply a traveler and is not native to Hallowness himself, but feels called to this place by some strange force. He finally states that neither himself nor your character seem well equipped to face the dangers that lie below. However, many have traveled down and fallen, and they might have had some useful supplies on them. After th that, he stops talking, and it is difficult to get any further information out of him. However, before leaving the temple, you may notice that Quirrell is wearing a mask on the top of his head, like a hat, and the mask shares a striking resemblance to one of the carvings on the boulder. Once you leave the temple, you will most likely come across a massive sleeping bug. Approaching this bug will lock you into the area, and the bug will wake up and start attacking you. This is the first minor boss of the game, and is known as the Gruz Mother. After defeating this boss, you are allowed to continue to an area with a few rundown houses, most of which are empty. One of the small houses, however, has a fly-like character named Sly. He has a slight orange tint in his eyes and orange particles floating around his head. He is also quietly humming a strange tune. He seems to be in some sort of trance until you talk to him, after which the orange particles and orange tint in his eyes disappear. He seems a bit confused and bewildered at first, but after a second he explains that something occasionally calls him to this place, and that if you hadn't come, he might have stayed down here forever. He thanks you for your help and then leaves. After that, you can find him in Dirtmouth, where he owns a shop and sells you items that can help you progress through the game. The next place of note that you will most likely find is an area of the Forgotten Crossroads with a large pill bug type creature blocking the entrance to an area that has bright green foliage growing from it. This is obviously where you need to go next. The only problem is that the large bug is blocking your way and won't let you pass. You can't talk with him, and if you approach him to try to attack him, he simply curls up in a ball and becomes immune to any damage. If you are going to get past him, you will need some sort of ranged attack. After this, you can find a bug humming a cheerful tune. This is Cornifer, another resident of Dirtmouth. He will appear once in every area of the game, and will sell you a map of the local area. This is very helpful for exploration, and you will always know that Cornifer is near when you hear his telltale joyful hum that sounds like this. <laughs> Eventually, you will come across the main boss of the Forgotten Crossroads, titled The False Knight. It's a pretty easy boss encounter, and after you beat him, you have access to the Snail Shaman. The Snail Shaman gives you the Vengeful Spirit, which is a spell that you can cast. It is also your first ranged attack, 
meaning you can now go defeat the creature blocking your path to the next area. But before we go there, I need to mention something that I haven't mentioned yet, and that is Soul. Soul acts like mana does in most RPGs. You gain soul whenever defeating an enemy, and can have a max of 3 charges at any point in time. This number gets extended if you find more soul containers throughout the game. One of the charges can either be used to heal a small amount of health, but at the cost of having to stand completely still for about 1 second, or the charge can be used to cast a spell. One of these spells is the Vengeful Spirit, so with that explanation out of the way, we can continue. After defeating the large bug that was blocking your path, you can make it to the next area of the game, Green Path. This is where you come across a bug that is standing on top of a ledge, wearing some type of cloak. And if you try to jump up to the ledge to talk to her, two things will happen. First is that she will leap off screen into the next load zone. And the second thing is that you will quickly realize that you just barely can't make it up the ledge, and will fall to the foot of it instead. The rest of this area is basically chasing after this mysterious bug. Occasionally, you will catch a glimpse of her before she darts away to the next section. This area is mostly for exploration and side quests, which I will not be including in this summary and review, so there isn't much else to talk about here, and I'm not going to go over these subjects because that would make this episode far too long, and I'm trying to prevent that. If you want me to make another episode or two covering these parts of the game, please let me know, but for now, I'm only going over the topics related to the main story of the game. Eventually, you track down this mysterious bug into a small portion of the area where she confronts you. She claims to know why you are here in Hallow Nest, and tells you that if you do not stop what you are doing and leave, she will have to stop you herself. After this, you become trapped in the small area and are forced to fight this mysterious bug whose name you now know is Hornet. This fight is a lot more difficult than the one against the False Knight, and will probably take you a few more tries to beat. As such, I recommend you start using charms in this fight if you have not already started to use them. Charms are equipable items that you can find throughout the game. These charms give you a small buff, like making your nail have more range, giving you more health, or making your spells do more damage. Charms are never required to progress through the game, however they do make it a lot easier to do so. After you manage to defeat Hornet, she admits that she underestimated you based on your small stature. However, she also warns that the next time, she won't hold back. After saying this, she leaps away, leaving behind the Dash Cloak. The Dash Cloak allows you to dash forward a short distance, either in the air or on the ground. After collecting the cloak, you must immediately learn how to use it in order to escape the boss arena, as the only way out is a spike pit that you can't jump over because of the low ceiling. This starts a trend that most of the other boss fights in the game follow, where you gain an item from the boss, and you then have to master it before you can leave. This, it is an incredibly neat concept that teaches you how each item works without having a long, drawn-out tutorial after each boss fight. Before leaving Green Path and making your way to the next area of the game, you can visit the Lake of Oon, where you will find a small house on the edge of the lake. When you enter the house, you can find Quirrell resting inside, polishing his blade. If you speak with him, he tells you that your blade looks worn out and you may have a difficult time from here on out. After speaking with Quirrell, you can continue your journey to the Fungal Wastes, the next major area of the game. Something that you will notice pretty quickly after entering the area is that it's much more difficult than the previous two. The difficulty of the game definitely starts to rise here. The Fungal Wastes, as you may have guessed by the name, are filled with mushrooms. There are mushroom NPCs, mushroom enemies, mushroom items, and just plain old mushrooms. Pretty soon after entering the fungal waste, you will come into a large open room. Suddenly everything will start to shake, and then a large bug jumps out of the ground. She has a cloth bag over her head with eye holes cut into it. Talking to her will reveal that her name is Cloth, and that she is looking for a formidable foe to challenge. She also mentions that she heard that uh, the Mantis tribe was around here somewhere. After this, you can make your way through the fungal wastes until you find the Queen's Station. This is a large room that seems to be the heart of the Stag Station network. The Stag Station rooms in different parts of the game are all connected and you can travel from one of them to any other station in the game. It's basically a fast travel system. 
Once you unlock it and open up the first stag station, a large multi-legged creature known as the Last Stag comes running in. He states that these stations were shut down a long time ago, so long ago that his memory of the network of tunnels is foggy, and he can't remember them well. But he thanks you for opening up one of them again, as he was trapped inside when all the stations were closed down. As a thanks for freeing him, he offers to take you to any station that you have opened. This is an ongoing thing throughout the game. Every major area of the game has a stag station that you can open. And each time you open one, the last stag remembers how the tunnel system works more and more. Eventually, when you manage to open up every station in the game, the last stag will say that he remembers one more station and offers to take you there. He brings you to the stag nest, where you can find out that his name is a lot more literal than you may have first realized as every stag in this station is dead, and every stag egg is broken. However, there is some hope, as one stag egg is still intact. Sorry for the extended explanation of the stag stations, but now we can get back to what is currently happening. For now, you can only travel between the Queen Station and Dirtmouth. Quirrell can also be found in the station, and he ponders about how the station was probably crowded back in its heyday. From there, you can continue until you find the Mantis village that Cloth was talking about. The Mantises are hostile to any outsiders, and will attack you if they see you. They are also incredibly strong, making this section of the game a semi-stealth segment where you try to avoid as many Mantises as possible. Once you make your way into the Mantis village, you can obtain the Mantis Claw. This is an item that lets you slide down walls and jump off of them, similarly to a wall jump in Super Mario Bros, or a wall kick in Metroid. Once you obtain the Mantis Claw, you can leave the Mantis Village and continue on your way. You will eventually spot Hornet again, however, as she did before, she will quickly dart away before you can talk to her. After this, you can use your newfound ability to enter the next and arguably most important area of the game, the City of Tears. The City of Tears is a city where it is perpetually raining, and I haven't mentioned the music in this game yet as to not get too convoluted, but I do have to mention it quickly here as the City of Tears has one of the best soundtracks in the game. Just listen to this small portion of the main theme for the area. See? The music in this game is great. I don't have much extra time to talk about here, and I wouldn't be able to do it justice even if I did. But trust me, it's really good. You should go listen to it for yourself. Soon after entering the City of Tears, you'll find Quirrell once again. Sitting next to him on the bench will have him explain the City of Tears to you. He explains that it got its name because it always rains here, and it never stops. He continues that it never stops raining, because when the city was built, they didn't realize that the city was built under a lake. Quirrell finally states that he would love to visit the lake someday, and he ponders about how it must be a great view. Once you make your way further into the city, you come across a large statue depicting the hulking creature that you saw in the opening cinematic, with smaller statues depicting the three bugs whose faces you can see on the boulder in the Temple of the Black Egg. The three bugs are standing around the large figure, looking up at it. Inscribed at the base of the statue, there is a message that reads, Memorial to the Hollow Knight. In the black vault far above, through its sacrifice, Hallownest lasts eternal. After reading this message, Hornet appears via cutscene and explains that the people of Hallownest knew about this infection a long time ago. The Hollow Knight and the, the three bugs known as Lurian the Watcher Monomon the Teacher, and Hera the Beast all offered themselves as part of a deal to stop the infection. The Hollow Knight would contain the infection inside of his body and then enter the Temple of the Black Egg. After that, they would seal the temple shut. Then, Monomon would cast a spell on herself and the other two that would put them into a deep slumber and tie their life force to keeping the Black Egg locked so that someone would need to kill all three of them in order to enter the Black Egg. The residents then hid the slumbering bodies of the three to keep them safe. However, Hornet continues by saying that this plan somehow didn't work, and the infection managed to escape. 
the Black Egg, and continue to spread with the Hollow Knight now acting as its host. Hornet then tells the player character that it's their job to find and defeat the three that are linked to the Black Egg, and then enter the Black Egg and defeat the infected Hollow Knight, and stop the infection for good. Hornet then ends the conversation by saying that if you are ready for the challenge, to meet her at the Kingdom's Edge. Hornet then leaves, and you take control of the game again. You can then continue through the City of Tears until you reach a large building called the Soul Sanctum. By reading the tablets within the Soul Sanctum, you find out that when the infection started, there were some who believed that it could be warded off using soul. But it would take a massive amount of soul, and the only way to get that much soul would be by killing hundreds of innocent bugs. These soul sorcerers brought this proposition to the King of Hallownest at the time, and he was so outraged by the idea that he banished the sorcerers who came up with it. However, the sorcerers proceeded with the plan against the wishes of the king, and started performing experiments. At first, this method seemed to work, even though there was an extreme cost. But eventually, the leader of the sorcerers fell to the infection, and his disciples were soon to follow. The massive amount of soul that they took gave them incredible powers, but it was not enough to ward off the infection. Eventually, you will make it to the top of the sanctum, where you will have to face off against the leader of the sanctum and the sorcerers, known as the Soul Master. This fight is very difficult, but once you manage to beat it, you will be rewarded with Desolate Dive, the second spell you unlock. This spell allows you to jump into the air and then dive down and slam onto the ground, killing anything in your way and breaking through fragile ground. After this, you can go to the next area, Kingdom's Edge. This is where Hornet told the player character to meet her after fighting your way through the area, which is one of the most difficult areas in the game, you finally find Hornet, where she once again challenges you to a fight. Once you enter the room that Hornet is in, you are locked in there until you either defeat her for a second time, or die trying. You should hopefully be able to defeat her, and once you do, she lets you enter the area that she was guarding. This leads you to the end of a tunnel, where you are magically bestowed with the King's Brand, making you the rightful King of Hallownest. You are then told to head to the resting grounds to find the Moth Seer, as she will train you and help you defeat the infection. Once you enter the resting grounds, you will quickly come across a statue of the three who are linked to the Black Egg. When you walk up to the statue, you are suddenly trapped within some kind of magic bubble. Then, Monomon, Lurian, and Hera appear in spirit form to t and tell you that you must defeat the infection for good. After telling you this, they suck you into a dream world, where the silhouette of a moth appears, and tells you to follow it. When you do, it leads you to a specific location within the dream world, and then gives you an item. The item is the Dream Nail, which will help you defeat the infection. After obtaining the Dream Nail, you awaken in the Moth Seer's house, and she admits that she's the one who helped you escape the dream world. She then explains that you are now within the possession of the Dream Nail, which will allow you to enter dreams, and that you can use this power to enter the dreams of the Hollow Knight. She finally tells you that there is a powerful god known as the Radiance that resides within the dreams of the Hollow Knight, and the Radiance is what's causing this infection. She explains that killing the Radiance will stop the infection. After this interaction, you are told to head to the Ancient Basin. Not long after you get to the Ancient Basin, you find Cloth once again, and she tells you how she was no match for the monsters here, and how she just hid in the ground until you got here. But now, she says, as being inspired by your bravery, she's going to keep going, even though she was going to give up. After speaking with Cloth, you can find a dead King's Mold in the Ancient Basin. King's Molds were the protectors of the King, and by hitting the King's Mold with the Dream Nail, you can enter its dreams and go to the White Palace, which is often considered the hardest area in the game. This area is extremely difficult and a platforming nightmare. There is even an alternate route that takes you to a new area that unlocks after beating the White Palace, called the Path of Pain. Once you make it all the way through the White Palace, you make it th to the Throne Room, and you find the former King of Hallownest. He is dead by the time you get there, slumped over on his throne. However, he holds an item that is vital to beating the Radiance, the right half of the King's Soul Charm.
This charm is required to even fight the Radiance, so now you must find the other half of the charm, and to do that, you must head back to the Mantis Village and challenge the Mantis Lords in order to gain access to Deep Nest, a horrible, dark, evil place that has been cut off from the rest of Hallow Nest. Once you start approaching the Mantis Lords, Quirrell will be standing right outside and warns you that the Mantis Lords are tough and to be careful. There are three Mantis Lords. When the battle starts, you only have to fight one of them, but after that you defeat that one, you have to fight the other two at the same time. The fight is fairly difficult, but once you get the hang of the rhythm, it's not too bad. The Mantis Tribe is all about honor, so once you defeat the Lords, not only do they allow you to proceed to Deep Nest, but every other Mantis in the village will become passive and not attack you for any reason. This is a nice touch that shows great attention to detail. Almost as soon as you enter Deep Nest, you will come across a hot spring that will fully restore your health and soul, and you're going to need it. Deep Nest is extremely difficult. Nearly every enemy is hidden from view until you trigger them, and some enemies are even disguised as NPCs. Quirrell is relaxing in the hot springs when you get there. If you speak with him, he says that he heard about a hidden village in Deep Nest that is exiled from the rest of Hallow Nest, and how the villagers there never accepted the king. If you can get through Deep Nest, then you can make it to the Queen's Garden, which is an area of the game where part of the Mantis tribe was exiled after they willingly took in the infection in order to become stronger. This means there is a previously unknown fourth Mantis Lord that is now known as the Traitor Lord and his disciples living in this area. When you get to the entrance of the area, you find Cloth waiting for you. She tells you how she plans to enter the area and defeat as many Mantises as possible before heading into the area. After this conversation, you can follow her in. Once you make it past an army of Mantises as well as other dangerous creatures, you finally make your way into the Traitor Lord to fight him. The Traitor Lord's fight is similar to the fight against the Mantis Lords, in that the fight is very difficult but gets much easier if you know the rhythm. As soon as you start the fight, Cloth jumps into the arena and starts to help you fight. After you have fought the Traitor Lord for a while, he impales Cloth on one of his sword-like limbs, but with her last bit of strength, Cloth slams her club down onto the Traitor Lord, and they both fall to the ground, dead. Once the Traitor Lord has been defeated, you can proceed to the next room, where the character known as the White Lady is. She is permanently stuck in this room, but she was the former Queen of Hallow Nest. Once you get there, she gives you the other half of the King's Soul Charm. You now have the completed King's Soul Charm. You now, now, you must defeat Monomon, Lurian, and Hera. Luckily, Monomon and Hera are both nearby, as you can see on your map. However, before you go there, when you go back into the Traitor Lord room, Cloth's ghost appears above her body, and she remarks about how well she did in battle, and hopes that she can reunite with her loved ones in the afterlife. You must first head to the Teacher's Archives, a building located in a small area adjacent to Queen's Gardens, called the Fog Canyon. Right outside the Teacher's Archives, you find Quirrell once again. He says that he feels strangely compelled to enter the building, but he's not sure about it. After this conversation, you can enter the building, where you will find Umu, a giant jellyfish-like creature that is guarding Monomon. After hitting it a couple of times, you realize that your attacks aren't doing any damage to it. Right as you're wondering how to defeat it, Quirrell jumps in and strikes Umu, making it more look, look more like a deflated balloon than a jellyfish. After this, your attacks will do damage for a short period of time before Umu can inflate itself again. After that happens, you must wait for Quirrell to strike it again. Rinse and repeat this method about 10 times, and then Umu will be defeated. From there, you can go directly to the room holding Monomon. Monomon appears to be encased in some sort of large test tube filled with water. Quirrell enters the room shortly after you, and reveals that he is Monomon's personal assistant, and the mask that he wears on his head that shares a likeness to Monomon is a protection charm that Monomon gave him before linking her life force to the Black Egg. She told Quirrell to leave Hallow Nest with the mask and only come back when he thinks it is safe. Quirrell then explains that as soon as he left Hallow Nest, he completely lost his memory and couldn't remember who he was or what he was doing. 
He further explains that once he re-entered Hallow Nest, sometime later, he slowly started regaining his memory. This is why he told you that he was a traveler near the beginning of the game, and why he didn't help you as much sooner. After explaining all of this, he takes the mask off his head and holds it up to the light. It disperses into particles and disappears. Quirrell then explains that the protective seal has been lifted from Monomon, and that she knows what must happen, and she will not fight you. Once you use the dream nail on her comatose body, you can enter her dreams, and she is standing there. You have no option but to continually hit her with your nail until she is defeated. After you wake up, Monomon's body is gone, and Quirrell is now sitting there without the mask. Quirrell says that now that his mission is complete, there is only one thing left for him to do, and leaves. Now, you must go find and defeat Hera and Lurian in a similar way to how you just defeated Monomon. Hera is located in the hidden city in Deep Nest that Quirrell hinted at earlier, and Lurian is located in his spire in the City of Tears. After defeating all three, you must head to the Black Egg and face off against the Hollow Knight and hopefully end the infection that is plaguing Hallow Nest. But on your way there, you can pass by the Blue Lake. This is the lake above the City of Tears that makes it constantly rain, and it is also the lake that Quirrell said he would like to see one day. Quirrell is found sitting on the edge of the lake. If you decide to sit next to him, you will get an achievement where the description reads, Spend a final moment with Quirrell. He also tells the knight that now, after seeing the world twice over, he finally feels at peace, and he is thankful that he could see its beauty again. After that conversation, you can finally get to the Black Egg, where Hornet is waiting for you. She warns you that if you enter the Black Egg, you cannot turn back, and you must fight to the end. You can enter the Black Egg and find the Hollow Knight strung up to the ceiling with chains, as you saw in the opening cinematic. In order to fight him, however, you must break the chains that are binding him. After releasing him, he lets out a roar and the battle begins. After a fierce battle that will most likely take you a few tries, you will finally damage him enough that Hornet will dive into the battle and hold the Hollow Knight down for a few seconds, giving you the chance to hit him with the Dream Nail and enter the Dream World one final time. Once you are in the Dream World, the Radiance appears as the final boss of the game. This is the most difficult fight in the game, but eventually, with a lot of work, you will deal the final blow to the Radiance. After being defeated, parts of the Radiance will start flying off in every direction as it blows up. The scene transitions to a cutscene that is viewed from outside of the Black Egg. The entire temple blows up and creates a crater. We see Hornet stand up in the crater, most likely having been temporarily knocked unconscious from the blast. She looks at the ground and sees the player character's helmet-like object cracked on the ground, implying that the blast destroyed him since he was closest to it. However, Hornet takes a look around and sees that the infection is slowly disappearing from the world, confirming that the Radiance is gone as well. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Greatest Games Podcast. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. And if you want to stay up to date on all the news about the podcast, please check out my Twitter account at Frederick Leland. Thank you.